All right. Well, it's time for my second presentation. I uh, hope you enjoyed the very first one on the relationship between the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, and the book of Revelation. As I mentioned to you, there is such a wealth of information to document that relationship between the Song of Moses and the book of Revelation. And yet, strangely enough, while many, many, many scholars have taken note of this relationship, of this conflation, and, and how the New Testament writers, how Jesus himself incorporated the Song of Moses into his ministry and the New Testament writers into their eschatological expectation uh, is, is something that is commonly, commonly ignored by so many commentators. And I can tell you this. In my upbringing in the churches of Christ, in the all-millennial world, I literally had no concept whatsoever. I have no memory whatsoever of a single Church of Christ minister ever, ever discussing the relationship and the importance of understanding the Song of Moses in order to understand biblical eschatology. And folks, here's the reason why. Foundational, absolutely foundational to the amillennial view of eschatology, and to a great extent, perhaps not as much, but to a great extent, it is also true of the postmillennial world. But foundational to, the, to amillennialism is the view that, number one, the law of Moses was, quote, nailed to the cross, unquote. Now, you can read my three volumes in which uh, I discuss Torah, to tell us the passing of the law of Moses. And volume one deals very, very specifically with this issue. And Lord willing, I'm and I'm still writing a book on the Sabbath that is maybe, maybe halfway finished. But nonetheless, this issue was the law of Moses nailed to the cross. And Men such as Kyle Pope that I've mentioned in my very first presentation are absolutely adamant that the law of Moses was nailed to the cross and that following the cross, God was no longer dealing with Israel in any way whatsoever to fulfill any of their covenant promises. Therefore, in his book, thinking about A.D. 70, Mr. Kyle Pope, denies that Deuteronomy chapter 32 has anything to do with biblical eschatology. He denies that it has anything to do with A.D. 70. Although, as we have noted, and as we will note in this presentation, he nonetheless says that it's distinctly possible that the Song of Moses may have, may have applied, quote, especially, unquote, to the first century. Well, he can only take the position, based upon his presuppositional view of the passing of the law, he can only take the position that the law of Moses applied up until the time of the cross. But as we are about to see, the New Testament writers, the book of Revelation particularly, is focused on the imminent fulfillment of the Song of Moses and particularly two things, two issues, two subjects. Number one, the great day of vengeance of our God. And number two, the avenging of the blood of the martyrs. So, before we get into that, let me, let me refresh our memories as to what I presented in my very first lesson. Point number one, I pointed out how that scholarship, biblical scholarship, that goes into and, and really focuses on the intertextuality uh, of Scripture. In other words, how, how or, and if the New Testament uses the Song of Moses, does it use it, how does it use it, etc. And I pointed out, major, major scholars, none of whom are preterists, all agree that the Song of Moses was paradigmatic for Jesus himself, for Paul, for Peter, and for John. 
Secondly, I pointed out to you how Josephus, first century, witness to the fall of Jerusalem, Josephus of the priestly family, who therefore understood the dominant worldview of the Jews and their attitude toward the Old Testament, Josephus believed that the Song of Moses was being fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem and in the events leading up to it. Number three, I pointed out and I demonstrated how the Jews of the day, and of course Josephus is a good representative of that, of how the Jews of the day believed that indeed, par pardon me, Indeed, the Song of Moses was to a great extent a road map of Israel's history. There was no question that throughout history, the song had application. But they also believed, this is pointed out by their great 11th century scholar Rashi and by other noted rabbis, they believed that the Song of Moses had an ultimate eschatological application to the last days. We have seen, in support of that, of course, that the language used by Moses as rendered in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, pointed to Israel's last days, the time of the end, and the end of the days. And we have seen that those who try to use linguistics, focusing on the Hebrew word akarit, to simply say, well, the Song of Moses was predicting events to happen sometime later, at a later time. They, they are guilty of a logical fallacy of illegitimate totality transfer because what do they do? They go to passages that are not discussing what the Song of Moses is discussing. And they find applications in those other passages Again, that are not part of a discussion of what the song is discussing, but they take that context and that definition of the word there, and they impose it on the song of Moses. Then we saw that in the New Testament, Peter, or excuse me, Jesus in Matthew 7, 17, 17, Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, Paul in his writings, and particularly, and boy, this is so critical, Paul, in Romans 10 and 11, cited the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, 19 and 21, which foretold the calling of the Gentiles into Israel's blessings, and Paul cited, not only cited the song, but he applied it to his ministry to the Gentiles. It was his justification for his ministry. Now look, folks, let me reiterate what I have stated. If the law of Moses was abrogated, annulled, taken out of the way, and removed it at the cross, then clearly Paul was wrong to apply the song to his ministry. So, in my first lesson, we discussed the time frame for the fulfillment of the Song of Moses. And let's, let's just hurry on because I've, I've already used up an awful lot of time here. So nonetheless, I want now to develop two other themes that are found that are part and parcel of the warp and the woof of the Song of Moses. Number one, the great day of God's vengeance. And number two, the avenging of the martyrs. These concepts are absolutely interrelated with one another. They cannot be divorced from one another, as we will see. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 35 and following, the Lord foretold a coming day of vengeance. When would that great day of vengeance be? Oh, in Israel's last days. Folks, do not forget that any and all attempts to divorce the song from Israel's last days is a futile exercise. It is unbiblical. But in Deuteronomy 32 and 35, the Lord says, In the day of vengeance I will repay. Verse 41, I will recompense those who hate me. Verse 43, He will avenge the blood of his saints. Now, 
The word that is used for vengeance, recompense, and avenge is from the Greek word in the Septuagint, ek dekesis. Now, I don't know that it's overly significant that that word is used three times. But, you know, in, uh, in Hebraic thought, three and seven and ten and twelve, etc., those are all perfect numbers. They are important numbers. They signify something. So it's interesting to me that the Song of Moses uses that Greek term, word, ek dekesis, this day of vengeance, three times. So again, we're going to focus on this concept of the day of vengeance and the subject of the avenging of the blood of the martyrs. Now there's absolutely no question Nobody's going to dispute the fact that there were days of vengeance in which God acted in history to bring wrath and vengeance even on pagan nations. In Isaiah chapter 34, one of the most graphic of the Old Testament passages that, that speaks of the, quote, great day of God's vengeance. It is the day of the Lord's wrath in which the Lord would come out of heaven. The earth would be melted. The constellations in the sky would fall from the sky and they would be melted and the mountains would melt. Oh, but wait. This is the day of God's vengeance against Edom. The Edomites. Oh, and by the way, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the Edomites when he was alive. And so, we have here a great day of God's wrath, a day of vengeance to be sure. It's not against Israel, but it is a day of wrath of ek dekesis. Likewise, in Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 10, it is a foretold day of vengeance. Who is this against? Well, in this case, it's against Babylon. Well, guess what? Neither one of these passages is involved with, is foretold, or part of the Song of Moses. However, in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, we find that there are the predictions of the last days, day of vengeance. And in these predictions of the last days, day of vengeance, it is against Israel primarily. Now what's interesting is that the book of Joel, uh, and boy I'd really love to develop this, but I just simply don't have the time for it. The book of Joel is about the great and the terrible day of the Lord. That's the great day of God's vengeance. It would be a time of judgment on the nations as well as Israel and the time of the vindication of the martyrs. But that's all I have time uh, to go into. But what we find is that in the Old Testament, there are passage after passage after passage that foretold the coming of the Lord in the day of vengeance at the time, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 35 and verse, verse 4, in a prediction of the establishment of the kingdom of God, it says, that the, your God will come with vengeance, and watch this, and he will save you. So here, vengeance and wrath and salvation are conflated. You know, there's a, there's a massive, massive hermeneutical fallacy out there that says, well, if this passage over here is talking about salvation, and if this passage over here is talking about judgment, then they can't be talking about the same event. Dispensationalists such as Thomas Ice like to say the major fallacy of preterism is that they talk about A.D. 70 being the judgment of Israel at the coming of the Lord. They fail to understand that the coming of the Lord is the day of salvation for Israel. No, we don't fail to understand that. We point out that the day of the judgment of Israel was also the day of the salvation of the righteous remnant. Salvation and judgment are Siamese twins that cannot be divided. 
Nonetheless, in Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 4, in a prophecy in, in which we find the prediction of the establishment of the highway of our God, in which the righteous man, even though he's a fool, he shall not err therein. If there are any lions there, they, there is no violence there. And on and on and on uh, the passage goes. This is a prophecy of the establishment of of the kingdom. And by the way, Jesus in his ministry in Matthew chapter 11 cited Isaiah chapter 35 and applied part of it to his personal ministry. So we know when Isaiah 35 was to be fulfilled, don't we? So we move on. I got man, I got to hurry. Okay. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17 and following, the Lord looked and he saw that there was no man the Lord looked and saw that there was no, no intercessor. Therefore, he put on the garments of righteousness. He put on the helmet of salvation. He put on the garments of vengeance. And he says, in verse 19 through 21, Vengeance is mine. I will recompense to those, like the song said, to those who hate me. But when would this be? Well, it would be in the day of salvation. And Paul, in Romans chapter 11, quotes verbatim from Isaiah 59 to speak of and to predict the coming to him, future to him, salvation of Israel at the coming of the Lord out of Zion. Now, here we go. This is amazing. Paul supposedly taught that the law of Moses was nailed to the cross. Yet here is Paul in Romans chapter 11, 25 to 27, anticipating the yet future to him fulfillment of Isaiah 59, which was a prediction of the coming of the Lord out of Zion in judgment. Judgment against his adversaries. It's the day of, pardon me, ekdekesis, the day of recompense. And who's it against? Well, all you got to do is read Isaiah 59, and it's against Israel. So you have the salvation of Israel, i.e. the remnant, and you have the destruction of Israel, the body. And of course then, we have the famous passage in Isaiah 61, 1-4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me, and He has, he has anointed me to preach the glad tidings of good things. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty the captives, to proclaim the acceptable year of our God and the day of vengeance, ek de kisis, of our God. Now here's what's important, of course. In Luke chapter 4, 16 and following, Jesus in the synagogue of Nazareth was given a scroll of Isaiah. He stood up and he read, and he read Isaiah 61, 1 through 4, He stopped at the statement, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good tidings of glad things, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He stopped right there. And some commentators say, well, that means he didn't come to proclaim the day of vengeance, which, of course, is specious. Because he did, throughout his ministry, proclaim the coming day of vengeance. Luke 21 22 in a passage describing the fall of Jerusalem. Jesus said, These be the days of vengeance, ek de kisis, in which all things that are written must be fulfilled. So here's Isaiah chapter 61 uh, predicting the coming of the Messiah who is going to predict and speak of not only the day of, of salvation of our God, but the day of vengeance, and Jesus foretold the day of vengeance, i.e. A.D. 70, when all things that are written would be fulfilled. We must move on. And of course, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 and following, Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, being persecuted by the Jews, and he said, It is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation, Greek word to ellipsis, those who are troubling you, and to give to you who are being troubled relief when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance, 
Greek word, ek, de, kesis, on those that do not know God. Here is Paul writing to the first century church, being persecuted by the, by the Jews, promising them they would receive relief at the day of vengeance, ek, de, kesis, against the Jews. Just like Isaiah 35, just like Isaiah 59, just like Isaiah 61, and a host of other passages that we don't have time to get to. So, then we come to the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 6, 9 and following, John said, He saw unto the altar the souls of those who had been beheaded, slain for the word of God. And they cried out, How long, O Lord, do you not avenge us on those who are on the earth? And they were given white robes and told to rest for just a little while until their fellow brethren and saints who should be slain as they were should be fulfilled. And what's next? The answer to their prayer. What is the answer to their prayer? It is the great day of wrath and vengeance of our God. Now, undoubtedly it's going to be in a third lesson, but the point is this. In Revelation 6, 16, and 17, that great day of God's wrath is a direct citation from Isaiah chapter 2 through 4, as well as Malachi chapter 3. So what we find here is that the Song of Moses foretold a day of vengeance, a day of recompense, a day of avenging in Israel's last days. I want now to look at a New Testament passage that utilizes the song in a very powerful, powerful way. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 30, the writer is writing to Christians who are being persecuted once again by the Jews. And he says, Call to mind, when you were very first illuminated, how you endured a great fight of affliction against yourself, partly by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became partaker of those, partners of those who were so afflicted. For you took great comfort, the writer says. You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing that you have in heaven a greater and an enduring substance because... We know the one who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He says that actually before he says, recall the former days. But now notice, he then says, Here he has a direct citation, direct quotation from the Song of Moses. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. I will bring vengeance on them, says the Lord. So Hebrews quotes directly from Deuteronomy 32 and a coming day of vengeance against Israel in Israel's last days. And the writer of Hebrews says in verse 37, and now in a very, very little while, he, the, the Greek of the text is, Hosan, Hosan, Mikron, how very, very little, or how, how little, if you please. And he will not tarry. And we have commentators telling us, well, you know, he, he's about to come now. Listen, as I filmed this, day before yesterday, someone wrote on my YouTube channel, the rapture, now they, they wrote this, okay, they wrote this on June the 10th, saying the rapture is going to be today or tomorrow. Well, here we are. I am actually filming this on the 12th. Hmm. The rapture was supposed to have been yesterday or the day before, and I guess I missed it. And if you're watching this, I guess you missed it too. So the gentleman, after saying that the rapture was supposed to be the 10th or the 11th, then turned around and said, well, it won't be any later than the 25th 
Oh, wait a minute. How do you go from the 10th and the 11th to the 25th? And, oh, by the way, you know what his justification was? Well, there were several ladies uh, on YouTube who, after all, have had dreams. You know, I'm not trying to be harsh or critical, but it may very well be that those ladies ate a bunch of jalapenos and they were having a reaction in their dreams. <laughs> well, anyway, the, the promise uh, uh, here of Hebrews chapter 10 is clear. It is emphatic. It is unambiguous. Hebrews promised the vindication of the saints at the day of wrath, ekdekesis, in the context of Israel persecuting the saints, and he quoted directly verbatim from the Song of Moses. Well, it brings us back to the point that I've made repeatedly in the first lesson and in this one as well. If it is true, as is taught by the amillennial and the postmillennial world, and by the way, even the dispensational world to a certain extent, they tell us the law of Moses was nailed to the cross. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Deuteronomy was part of the law of Moses. Even Thomas Ice, with whom I've had four debates, says in one of his writings, the entirety of the law of Moses, including Deuteronomy, has been fulfilled and taken out of the way forever. Okay, wait a minute. Here's the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, promising suffering saints that their persecutors are going to be judged in the day of vengeance foretold by the Song of Moses. But Hebrews was written years after the cross. Do you see the problem? So, here's what's important. The concept of wrath and vengeance at the great day of God's wrath vindication, vengeance, etc. That term, that concept is found 16 times in the book of Revelation. And that day of wrath and vengeance would be against Babylon, the great persecutor of God's people. Now, do you catch that? The day of wrath, the day of vengeance, the great day of God's wrath and vengeance, that motif is found mentioned 16 times in the book of Revelation, and it is focused on the judgment of Babylon. So we ask the question, who in the world is Babylon? I remember a book entitled, Who is this Babylon? Might get a copy of that. Well, Babylon is, according to the book of Revelation, it is the city that, quote, killed the prophets, Revelation 16, 6. Those are Old Testament prophets. Well, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Rome never killed an Old Testament prophet. The Roman Catholic Church never killed an Old Testament prophet. And oh, by the way, America never killed an Old Testament prophet. Number two, it is the city where the Lord was crucified. Revelation 10 or 11 verse 8. Number three, it is the city guilty of killing the apostles and the prophets of Jesus and of shedding all of the innocent blood shed on the earth. Revelation 18, 20 and 24, which by the way is a direct echo of Jesus' words in Matthew 23 29 and following, that he emphatically said that the judgment of those who had shed all of the blood, shed on the earth, would be acquired, required and avenged in that generation. Not some future generation, that generation. And so, here is this city, Babylon, who, by the way, in, in killing the prophets, Jesus, and the apostles and prophets of Jesus, she was filling up the measure of her sin. The cup of her sin was full. 
Revelation 17 and verses 6 and following. Now, I want to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, there's not another city, there is not another entity, uh, there, there is no uh, conglomerate identity of some proposed Babylon that is a, quote, composite, unquote, of Jerusalem and Babylon, literal Babylon and literal Rome. and No, 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 no. Babylon never killed an Old Testament prophet. Rome never killed an Old Testament prophet. Only one city, only one entity was, do, was, was guilty of doing the things that the book of Revelation says Babylon was guilty of doing. Not one city, not one entity. And we find in that book of Revelation describing the impending, at hand, soon to come judgment of that city, Babylon, we find the prediction of the day of wrath and vengeance foretold by the song of Moses that said that in Israel's last days, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And in Revelation 19 and verse 2, at the destruction of Babylon, the song of victory, the song of triumph is sung. The Lord has avenged the blood of His saints. A direct echo, a direct citation of Deuteronomy 32 and verse 43. Now remember, folks, Moses foretold the last day, the coming of the last days, day of vengeance. Once again, verse 35. In the day of vengeance, I will repay. Verse 41. I will recompense those who hate me. By the way, it is important to note that this word recompense and ek dekesis means I'm going to pay back. And in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 6, we have the Lord you are righteous, O Lord, because you have repaid, basically. So, we have this concept of vindication and ek dekesis for what this Babylon did. So, if you're going to identify Babylon as some city that never ever did and could not have done what Revelation describes Babylon as having done, there was no payback there. There was no, to use the Latin term, lex talionis, which is eye for eye, if you please. It's giving payback. So Moses foretold this coming day of vengeance in which the Lord said, I will repay. Furthermore now, please pay attention. If the song, if the song of Moses, or you know what, even if one other Old Testament prophecy of the last days, day of vengeance foretold, number one. If, it for, if any Old Testament prophecy foretold the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, or if even one of them foretold the destruction of Rome, or if even one of them foretold a yet future or even a post-cross day of vengeance, then guess what, ladies and gentlemen? The futurist view, all-millennial, post-millennial, even dispensational, the futurist view of the passing of the law of Moses is wrong. Listen, when a law is abrogated, it's abrogated. Period. Done. Over. Mr. Kyle Pope, that I have cited, says in his book, if a law or a covenant has been abrogated, annulled, taken out of the way, it is no longer applicable. So let me reiterate. If even one Old Testament prophecy foretold A.D. 70, or foretold the destruction of Rome, or foretold absolutely any post-cross day of vengeance. Listen. If any Old Testament prophecy foretold the end of time, 
then the law of Moses didn't pass away at the cross, and the law of Moses will remain valid until that proposed end of time. Without any doubt whatsoever, Revelation is focused on the last day's day of vengeance in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And as we will see, it had to be fulfilled in AD 70. So let me drive home the point that I've been getting at, that I've already stated, that is so critically important for our understanding of the applicability of the Song of Moses to the book of Revelation. As we have seen, the Song of Moses foretold the last days, day of vengeance, it foretold the day of the Lord. Clearly, Revelation is focused on the last days, day of vengeance, and that day would be against Babylon. Now remember, remember this, and I know I'm repeating, but this is important. Futurism says that God was through with Israel at the cross, and that Revelation was anticipating the destruction of Rome as Babylon, or even the Roman Catholic Church at the supposed end of time. That's the view I was raised on, by the way. But that demands, as we just saw, that the Old Testament would remain in force, remain in effect, until the fall of Rome or until the end of time. Now, to escape this inescapable dilemma, it must be proven that although Revelation, listen, pay, and pay very careful attention here, it must be proven that although Revelation cites, echoes, and quotes more Old Testament prophecy than any other New Testament book, over 400, some sources say four, 440. So even though Revelation incorporates, cites, echoes, alludes to the Old Testament prophecies over 400 times more than any other Old Testament book or any, any other New Testament book, it has to be shown that it was not actually anticipating the fulfillment of those prophecies, but in fact was somehow, for some reason, simply using that language to describe events totally unrelated to what those Old Testament prophecies foretold. And yet, and yet, John was told emphatically, in Revelation 10, 6 and 7, he saw one angel standing on land and on sea who raised his hands and swore by him who lives forever and ever, and that in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, which by the way is the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 50 and 51, that in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God, as foretold by the prophets, would be fulfilled. Well, what prophets is John alluding to? What prophets does John cite, quote, allude to, and echo more than any other New Testament book? It's the Old Testament prophets. It is therefore, it seems to me, extremely specious to say, well, yeah, you know, uh, the Song of Moses, it did foretell the day of vengeance in Israel's last days. Now, I, I, have, to, I have to throw this little ever so brief digression in here back to the point I've been emphasizing. If you take the position, number one, that Akarit and the Song of Moses just simply means that sometime later. Uh, no, definite, no, no definite generation is in mind. And of course, that's contra Paul. That's contra Peter. That's contra Jesus. When the Greek that they used pointed to a single generation. The perverse, the generation. This. Acts 2.40 tells us. So, when you try to make the Song of Moses applicable, you know, here and here and here and here and here, at what point is the Song of Moses no longer applicable? Well, again, Kyle Pope tells us that it's certainly distinctly possible that the Song of Moses applied, quote, especially, unquote, 
to the first century. So in his view, remember, the Song of Moses could not apply after the cross. But here we have the New Testament writers after the cross repeatedly quoting and applying the Song of Moses to their generation. Now, <clears throat> since we have Jesus, Peter, Paul, Hebrews, and Revelation, all applying the Song of Moses to their generation after the cross, and yet they are applying it to the day of the Lord, then that means that the final application, the last day's application, was in the first century unless you want to argue that the Song of Moses, which is about Israel, it's not about the church, and it's not about the last day's period of the church, it's about Moses. So since we have the New Testament writers, once again, we have Jesus, we have Peter, we have Paul, we have Hebrews, we have Revelation, all applying the song to their day, their time, and the imminent day of the Lord. So if you're going to apply the song to any point after the first century, to any day of the Lord, day of vengeance, and the avenging of the martyrs, if you're going to apply the song to any time after the first century, however long you extrapolate that fulfillment, if you're going to say, oh, well, the song is yet to be ultimately fulfilled, maybe, then at that ultimate fulfillment, the Song of Moses will remain valid, binding, and applicable until that last day's fulfillment. And so this, this motif, this motif of the day of vengeance of our God is an absolutely critical motif. And when we realize that here is John in the book of Revelation using the terminology of vengeance and wrath 16 times to speak of the impending judgment of Babylon, which can be no, no other city than Old Covenant Jerusalem, in other words, the Jews of Deuteronomy 32. And he says that judgment was at hand, and then he goes ahead and he quotes verbatim from Deuteronomy 32 to sing the song of praise and glory and worship of God because Deuteronomy 32, 43 was fulfilled in that judgment. Folks, I simply do not see how anyone could legitimately argue, well, yeah, Deuteronomy 32 is about vengeance on Israel. Well, it wasn't just about vengeance on Israel prior to the cross. It was about vengeance on Israel after the cross. And it was about vengeance on Israel, as just stated. It's not about vengeance at some proposed, pardon me, proposed end of time. Let me reiterate, the Song of Moses and its promise of the vindication of the martyrs absolutely has nothing to do with the end of time, has absolutely nothing to do with the judgment of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, or America. And thus, when the New Testament writers are quoting from the Song of Moses and applying it to their day, they are applying it to the impending judgment of Jerusalem and Israel. Well, I haven't gotten to my fourth point, and that is the day of vengeance in direct conflation with the avenging of the martyrs of God foretold by Deuteronomy 32, verse 43, 
which was a prophecy of the avenging of the martyrs of God in the judgment of Israel in Israel's last days. Now, in anticipation, if you're going to posit another yet future, quote, end of time avenging of the martyrs, then you're going to have to get it from some other book different from Revelation, different from Hebrews, different from Thessalonians, different from Corinthians, different from Romans or any other New Testament book that directly quotes, cites, and alludes to the song of Moses. And I say respectfully, you cannot find a different prophesied and predicted great day of God's wrath for the avenging of the martyrs divorced from the song of Moses. Well, I'm out of time for this lesson, so I, I'm going to have to I'm going to I'm I'm going to have to give the rest of this lesson in maybe two installments. So see, that's one of the advantages advantages of having a <clears throat> virtual Predators Pilgrim weekend. It doesn't take up time away from any other speaker. How about that? All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your good attention if you've given me that. I hope this lesson resonates. I hope you can see the importance of the Song of Moses to the book of Revelation. And as we shall see when we get to the end of this discourse, what this means is that the Song of Moses is fulfilled in the book of Revelation, and that calls for the rejoicing of the Gentiles with God's people because the Gentiles are now fully incorporated with Israel into the new creation. Thank you so much.